funding nonprofit dedicated to nurturing socially engaged art, and we find artists and collectives working directly with communities in ways that are relevant to everyday life at ambitious scale. And we have a very, very ambitious duo here this evening, Noreen Letty and Liz Slagus, who are together our sex ed. And tonight's discussion is part of something we call Reports from the Field. Reports from the Field is a way of bringing into the ABOG space people who are working with the artists we support. So oftentimes you hear about what the artists are doing and their perspective, and they're used to kind of talking about their own work, but you don't hear what it's like to participate in these projects. Um, and so this program is designed to give you an opportunity to learn about what these wonderful folks are doing and who they're working with. And so that's, um, that's why we have this particular panel convened this evening. So Noreen and Liz on the end here are our uh, fellows from this year, and they're collaborating on developing radical pedagogies that combine art, reproductive health, and participatory tools. And they've been working on developing a sex ed curriculum at Washington Irving High School. We also have with us Brianna Williams, who is a Community Health Corps member, currently serving as Adolescent Health Educator at the Washington Irving campus. Uh, Brianna's been working directly with sex ed in the classroom, in the cafeteria, in after school out outreach projects. And she received her undergrad education from Columbia University, where she volunteered at the Peer Health Exchange for four years. Uh, we also have Caitlin Hansen, who is the Director of School-Based Health and Adolescent Medicine at the Institute for Family Health. She currently manages three school-based health centers in Manhattan, serving ten public schools. <laughs> I don't want her job. <laughs> uh, Caitlin began her work at the Institute in 2010 as Community Outreach and Health Education for uh, the Institute's Washington Irving Campus Health Center, and that's sort of the center that uh, these folks are, are based out of. Um, we also have Corey Silverberg, who's a sexuality educator, author, public speaker, and was founding member of the Commons You Go Cooperative. He received his Master's of Education from the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education and served as Chair of Sexuality Educator Certification for the American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, and teachers on topics including sex and disability, sex and technology, pleasure, inclusion, and access across North America. He's currently writing a series of three books for children about sexuality for Seven Stories Press. The second book, Sex is a Funny Word, will be released in July. Uh, he can be found online at sexuality.about.com. Uh, and so with that, I intend to close my mouth for most of my <laughs> uh, And I want to hear from these folks. And I'm interested particularly to hear about um, how, how all of you came to <laughs> How all of you came to, I thought I had a few guys going on, um, came to work together on this project, what brought you to the project, what inspired you for the project, um, and how you wound up um, working with the kids over at Washington Irving. So anybody can just sort of pop right up. We don't have quite enough mics for everybody, so we're going to have to pass it back. Why don't you guys start? Yeah. Sweetheart. Um, you can absolutely do your, your presentation. Um, it would be great to hear from each of you a little bit on, on sort of um, what it is you personally do, like a little bit more than just sort of the, the vibe. Uh, sure. Um, so Liz and I first met at Ibeam in 2006. Um, Ibeam used to be in Chelsea. And I was doing, a, I was an artist in residence doing um, the Effort ID project, which was a platform shoes that functioned as both platform shoes for sex workers and also platforms for discussion about sex work. Um, and they were created based on interviews and discussions that I had with sex workers, and there was functionality that was very specific to people that I worked with. So Liz and I then got along really well. We both loved <laughs> diners. We had multiple like diner dates here and there. <laughs> 
And then um, we actually, Liz invited me to be part of Girls Eye View. Liz was the director of public programs and education at IBEAM. And Girls Eye View was a project with um, a New York City public high school, with young women from the high school. And so we actually did a project together where we had young girls basically doing their own kind of shoe hacks, right, in a similar way that we had done with the Platforms project, which was really amazing. And we also started curating shows together. Like, not only did we sort of come together around, you know, our this idea of participatory collaborative artwork, but also um, we also just loved videos. We got a bunch of curating offers from City Without Walls. Um, and we put together some really great video shows. So it just seemed like we had this really great synergy, would you say? Like, I yes. mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So that was the beginning. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to take it to your like two more slides and then we'll pass it back. Is that good? Sure. So, um, yes, we kept having these conversations and diner meetups, and um, we kept talking about the kinds of projects that we wanted to do together and things that were compelling to us, and um, sex education just became this thread in our conversations, and, um, and the fact that we were both really angry about things, um, and we... Well, I think the young girls, like, people leaving girls I view because they were pregnant, right, like, in a way that didn't seem like they maybe necessarily had Right. We were noticing things with the young people that we were working with, and we started talking a lot about um, our own sex education and some of the privileges and lack thereof that we experienced in our own education and what we were witnessing. And we decided that we, you know, we wanted to work around this. And so I basically gave Noreen this like crazy brain dump one uh, at one of the diners. It was um, a scroll. It was, <laughs> <laughs> it was like this it's really long like, poster drawing. Of, of this project that kind of encompassed all the, the things that um, we had been talking about, and it was sort of this just like crazy project idea. And I was like, do you, do you want to do this together? And she said yes. Um, and so we refined the scroll to this like very kind of like hilariously sterile <laughs> diagram that we kind of loved and like thought sort of um, looked like it was out of a science textbook that we also kind of loved. And um, but basically we decided that sex ed would be this project where we would do collaborative projects, collaborative art-based projects with different communities in conversation and collaboration with um, sex educators um, about sexual health topics that um, were important to and meant something to the communities that we were working with. And we would document them in such a way so that they could be shared as tools and resources and contribute to this conversation about sex education and these issues that we were um, that we were that we were having issue with. And we refined that um, diagram to um, to this logo, um, which we were very excited about because it was a little more sexy and um, and arty and um, kind of just represented the project and what we wanted to move forward with. And then we um, met some of these folks and um, because Noreen and I are not sex educators, we maintain. Um, this is very much um, a, an art project, um, and uh, we, we need the collaborators that are sitting here with us in order to do that work. Um, we want to poke at the really bad sex education that's out there. We want to highlight the really awesome sex education, because there is some. A lot of it's in Canada, which is why Corey's sitting here. Um, but. You know, these were the things that um, that we wanted to. These are the reasons why we started working with the people that are sitting here. Um, so our first big project was actually we did a couple of things. We had an on an online exhibition, which is still ongoing, um, called "You Wish You Would Have Known To," where we asked people to make videos that, in some way, shape, or form, very loosely answered the question, "What do you wish someone had taught or told you about sex?" This is a video still from a really beautiful video by an amazing artist named Robert Dickerson, whose name will also come up later, because <laughs> he was also at the salon. Yes, Robert. Okay. All that comes together, right? <laughs> so this is a piece by Robert, um, which is basically about how um, sex is more than just penetration. And it's beautiful, it's artful, it's thoughtful, and we have used this piece over and over again in discussions with people about sex. It's like people watch it, and it's different. It's not a PSA. 
right? Like it's very much not a PSA, but it's this really amazing kind of conversation starter about this particular topic. And you know, we're still collecting submissions if you guys after this talk want to send us stuff, we'll just know. Um, so uh, we actually launched the project at Coochie Fritos with this show, right? So we had commissioned several artists to make work, including Karen B.K. Chan, whose video Jam went viral, which was really great. And that's actually how we first met Corey, because he knew Karen was really excited about the video and our project. And then we had lunch in Jersey City, right? <laughs> Right? Yeah, go Jersey City. <laughs> we're both based in Jersey City. We had lunch in Jersey City. I loved Corey's book. It was really great. Um, yeah, and that's like basically how our relationship started. Yeah. Uh, so, um, February 2013 was basically when we launched this project to the public through this exhibition of Gucci Frida's Gallery, um, which was this amazing platform, and actually, I think to this day, one of my favorite public platforms for the project because it was an Essex Street Market. And so it allowed all these different publics to come into the project and see what we're doing. And if anybody knows, that's at Street Market. Um, Shopsons is there, and the, like, it was amazing to have the like old curmudgeon um, who owns that place be like, yeah, come get what you guys do. And uh, they actually like walk in there and, you know, and talk to us, which was really, you know, what, what that video project was about. It was about accessibility, really, um, and just involving a lot of voices in the conversation. Um, but that that spring of 2013 was really important because we, we met a lot of people that um, you know became essential to the work that we're doing now. Um, Natalia Elman um, Petrozello was one of those people um, who runs this project, Health Class 2.0. She is a sex ed historian, um, and she introduced us to Caitlin Hansen. Yeah, that's how we know Caitlin. Um, and that project brought us over to Washington Irving High School campus, which is that building, um, which is beautiful. Um, it is also a Title I school, it was, um, which is why it was chopped up into six different high schools, which is something that Denver did. Um, for better or worse, um, but it also allowed the school-based health center to be there. Um, so the deal is with that, and Kate won't correct me if I'm wrong, but basically this is a service that um, is provided only to Title I schools who are underperforming. A certain percentage, very high percentage of those students um, are eligible for school lunches. Um, but what's kind of amazing is that this is this incredible resource, like incredible. They receive um, the students at the school from day one, um, their <coughs> parents sign waivers, and they receive free healthcare, um, uh, reproductive health counseling, um, sex education, uh, birth control, <laughs> birth control um, physical exams, um, there are social workers there. It's just this really amazing comprehensive um, uh, Center. Um, and uh, that um, basically those two connections brought us to Washington Irving. Um, through the project with Health Class 2.0, we began our um, the way that we worked in terms of the research that we collect and this, you know, we, which was basically going into cafeterias and talking to the students about what they wanted from their sex education, what they thought about sex education. Um, you know, still one of the biggest questions that we get is when is the right time to have sex? Um, so these students really want to talk about um, sex and, um, and the big thing was to figure, figuring out ways to, to not answer that question for them, but for them to figure out that they will figure that out for themselves with some really good information. Um, we um, developed a lot of uh, tools that we use in the classroom, things like creating safe spaces, which is you know a practice that is very much part of a good sex educator's practice. Um, you need to create a really safe um, environment for um, good sex education to happen. Um, people need to feel like they can trust you, um, that um, you know they're in a place where everything that they say is not going to be repeated. Um, and we also started to collect a body of work that we would then use to inspire the students. Um, Barbara Kruger and Grant Fury being among those artists. Uh, we also, at the same time as our work in Washington Irving, are, have been running a course at Parsons. It's called a collab or a collaborative research studio. 
And it's this great course that they offer to upper level students where you get to actually participate in a faculty's particular kind of practice, right? And the idea is that we're all kind of making work around a similar kind of research question, right? So um, ours obviously is about art and sex education. And so we've been also been working with Caitlin and Brianna this year, right? With our person students to design, again, these sort of short engagements with the students of Washington Irving that again somehow combine art and sex education. So on the left, we have that really amazing talk about consent sticker that was designed by one of our students this year that everyone loved at the health fair. They were like all over everyone, everywhere. <laughs> and then on the right, we have a really great example of one of the posters that our students designed um, for a potential sort of ad campaign, right? It's totally okay to be green. What matters is when you're ready, right? With the little hashtag, I'm a green banana. So. <laughs> see if she decides to do anything with that. I hope that was a really great example. Um, our students also make short videos. We have them usually make contributions to our you know, YouTube exhibition. We were just talking with somebody earlier um, about porn versus reality, right? which is a really big issue for a lot of our collab students. Right? We have multiple, issue -ish, multiple videos along this topic right? of what are the differences between porn and reality. Um, we also have worked with our students to develop games. This was a game that was actually co-created with Washington Irving students in the cafeteria about sexting. This is really popular. We have these actually available for download on our website for educators to use. This is a very popular one because there's almost no curriculum that talks about sexting in any way, shape, or form, and yet this is the way that almost all high school students are communicating with each other about anything around sex and sexual health. Um, so, you know, for this particular game, like, there would, be, you know, there would be a particular scenario that one of the students had experienced, and with the game, you would sort of get the card and then talk about ways that you would deal with that situation. So, all of that um, led us to um, developing uh, our sexual health advisory board, because again, we are not um, sex educators, and we, want, we needed a body of counsel. Um, they are our backbone. Um, sitting here right now um, for a reason they are collaborators and um, and you know they they make the work that we do um, possible and we are inspired by them um, and because of that support we were able to um, go to Caitlin and say how about if we were artists in residence at uh, Washington Irving High School's um, school-based health center and she said yes uh, and then we applied and received later grass funding, which is why we're sitting here. Um, and that's really why and how we got here. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> This is a good time to, you know, introduce. We, we basically created this project, Learn Consent, um, which was the project at Washington Irving High School that we ran with. Um, and, um, you know, Caitlin is the head of these school-based health centers. Um, Brianna Williams um, is the health educator, and that was our real partner in crime on the ground every day that we were at the school. Um, and it's just amazing. <laughs> um, I think it's a good time to. Well, I mean, so you, and you, Liz and Noreen, one of them explained how we met. Um, there's one, so, someone who made a video, which is this great video called Jam. She's a Canadian sex educator, and she sent it to me, and I was in Jersey City at the time. Um, for me, I mean, what, what was interesting, and there's a couple things that were interesting for me. One of the things I'm very interested in is this question of who is a sex educator. So sex education is a weird career. Um, it's not clear how one gets into it. Like, there's, there's, there's two programs in the U.S., one is a degree mill, so for seventeen thousand dollars you can get a PhD. Uh, and it's very clearly a degree mill, and everyone knows it. Um, and the other is an actual university, and it's okay. But 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 other than that, <clears throat> how you become a sex educator is is kind of a weird, odd road. Um, and because of, for four years I was in a position of certifying sex educators, I was getting emails from hundreds of people out there every year who wanted to be sex educators, and they were they wanted to know how to do it, and there isn't one way to do it. Um, and <clears throat> I worked, my dad was, was a sex therapist, that was my phone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to pick it up, I don't to leave it, I'll leave it for now. Um, um, it's a participatory art thing, right? 
Oh, yes. And I just sit in totally. uncomfortable silence. <laughs> That's what I was. I don't know any about art, obviously. Um, but uh, uh, I had worked in sex stores all my life since I was 16 years old, and a lot of people, when feminist sex stores began, when they began in the, like, the early 70s, people worked there, and it was a, it felt, it felt like they were doing more than just selling vibrators and dildos. It felt like they were educating. And so there's actually hundreds of people whose only experience is selling sex toys who feel like they're sex educators, and I'm not sure they're not. So anyway, it was very interesting for me when Liz and Ari described sort of what they were doing, and that they're, they're, they're artists and educators, but they're not sex educators. And, and um, so that was sort of one of my main kind of interests in, in the project, is that kind of interesting question, is who gets, to, who gets to go in and start conversations, and what do the conversations look like? That's the other thing, is that I'm very concerned about how sex education is incredibly white and it's incredibly m medical, and so all the conversations that flow out of that are white and medical. Um, and when you're going to a school where actually, you know, I don't know what the percentage is, but the majority of students are not white, um, and probably not also doctors, um, how does that, what comes out of it? And I think that the idea of starting with something that's more framed as art, as opposed to some kind of educational curriculum, it's just more interesting for me. So. That was my answer. I'm gonna get my phone now. Oh, you're out of time. Oh, you're out of time. Yeah, this, this is why I love sex education. Yeah, I met you two shortly after you met Corey, I think, partially because the sex education community in New York and the health education community when it comes to adolescents is really actually small in this giant city. Um, so I had done some work with Health Class 2.0 uh, through the new school with um, Natalia Petrozelev, as you mentioned, and um, she just knew that we would get along with each other <laughs> and introduced us and I mean we're always as a small school based health center we're always looking for community expertise to bring in to enrich the programs that we can provide with the small amount of funding that we have so particularly when it comes to involving people who are involved in higher education with the students that we have that are in high school um, our high school graduation rate is about 38 um, percent so we really want to bring students in contact with college students and with professors that are accessible and interested in them and to really show them what it can be like. A big part of this project has been about starting conversations and that's absolutely what it does just to be around um, these inspiring people. So uh, a little bit more about the school-based health center. I don't know how much you guys all know about them, but I thought there was a pretty good background given already. <laughs> um, but essentially we're a full service primary care office. We just happen to be located inside this building. Um, so we really do look for schools to go into that have traditionally lacked access to health education, to healthcare services, um, to mental health care, dental health, and just become a part of that community and be in that building and provide care for the patients or the students that are in that building every day. So we have a really unique opportunity to get to know the students in the building as students rather than just patients of ours. and. You know, we see them in the classroom, um, we see them interacting with their friends, with their teachers, we um, get, you know, we don't, we don't really deal with discipline, but we know about the, how they get in trouble around the school, and, you know, we see them individually in the health center, and, you know, they present a completely different idea of themselves when they're behind closed doors with us in the health center, but we get to kind of care for them on all of those levels and help them figure out where they're going next. So our goal, you know, we're not part of the Department of Education. We are an uh, independent, federally qualified, nonprofit community health center. Um, and so technically our little zone is not a Department of Education space. So we can do a lot more with, with our space than they can with the rest of the school. <laughs> um, and teens in New York City have uh, a decent amount of rights. When it comes to reproductive health care, they are completely in control of themselves. Um, they can make any type of reproductive health decision that they want to and it's, and it's totally legal. So that's what we're there to help them do um, as a part of their general health care. Um, so we do a lot of Kind of seating reproductive health is a completely normal part of your healthcare, your experience uh, in your life. And we're also just there to make sure that the students in the building are able, are healthy enough to be able to engage in their education um, and remove any barriers between what they need when it comes to their health and their ability to get it. So they don't have to have parents miss work to take them to the doctor, they don't have to miss school. Um, and we can help them, I mean, thinking about sitting in class, not being able to see the board or with a toothache or terrified that you're pregnant, there's no way you're gonna learn in those types of situations. So we're there to both help provide the education, but also to give students the actual tools that they need to act on that. Um, so we do dispense birth control there on campus. Um, this past month, we just started inserting IEDs for the first time. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, so we really, I mean, we respond 
respond to the needs of the community. If there's something that we're doing that they you know, don't need, we scale back on that. If there's something that they do need, we push forward. And uh, definitely engaging with teenagers. You know, you need to do lots of different types of programs and services to engage them on the same topic. So um, this type of a program engages a totally different group than some of the other work that we do. And you know, Brianna does education in the classroom on a more structured curriculum that she's worked on. So any opportunity we have to start these conversations and keep them going, whether it's actually in a clinical encounter, in a health center, or in some type of preventive education around the school is you know, our entire purpose in being there. Um, and to answer your question, it's, I think we're at 94% non-white students. So definitely coming from um, you know, a health center where we do have a lot of um, you know, white women who are traditionally our employees. Um, by chance, that's something that we're always aware of and that we kind of try to um, speak to openly um, with the students that we serve. Uh, there's, everybody has been to high school for the most part, so we can like, connect on a lot of different ways and you know, really try to find ways to make the students, um, just to give them a safe space to be themselves and to figure out what that means and struggle with some of the ideas behind um, their adolescence. So. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so my name is Brianna. I came um, to meet Liz and Noreen uh, at the beginning of my service year um, because I work in the school based health center working as the like in class health educator. So I get to do a lot of going into the classes, developing curriculum, but also doing after school programs and meeting with the students in the cafeteria. Um, and they are just they are so much awesomeness embodied into like these these beautiful people that are each unique and blooming flowers. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it, it's funny because when they showed the, the slide of the different like index cards, those are literally the questions I get every day walking through the halls. Like someone will come up to me and be like, Miss, like I think I did something, like I, I had sex yesterday. And I'm like, okay, so how, how was it? Did, did you enjoy it? Was it good? And they're like, oh, um, yeah. Okay, and that, that's an interaction right there. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I get to spend a lot of time with the students, engaging them in whatever environment um, is best for them. Sometimes it's in the ele elevator, sometimes it's, um, you know, in their PE classes, but it's always fun and always exciting. Even more so with Liz and Noreen, because now they actually get to make stuff instead of having people talk at them all day, as they already do, so. Yeah, I mean, if I could just say something. So, and if I, people here are probably, how many people had some kind of formal sex education in like their school or something? Yeah, okay, so most people. And it is always someone, it's usually someone just talking to you, and that's one of the things that's so exciting with the idea of doing something and making art is that you're you're actually like sex education is often designed to be boring because we're not supposed to it's not appropriate to have fun when you're talking about sex with young people um, uh, which in some ways might be true because there's boundaries but getting to do art can be fun um, and appropriate i guess <laughs> it's like learning through making and thinking yeah. through making right i feel like it's about like, processing whatever discussion that you've had first right we did some talking at the, you know, at the front of the room, of course. Um, but then the actual great conversations that we had where we would go into groups and they would be working on their designs and we would talk to them about, you know, why, why are you choosing that image? What does that mean to you? Um, can you talk about, you know, can you tell me about that? What would you say to somebody else? What are some of the issues that come up with that? I mean, are there are there things that that you encounter that you have a hard time addressing or are there, there tough questions that are common questions that, that you've had to really sort of rethink your whole approach on or, or anything like that? This is for everybody, not just me. But not just the yeah, there are definitely boundaries that you have to put in place um, and things that, um, you know, we wouldn't necessarily, we, we wouldn't talk about. Um, and one of the reasons also that we've, you know, so our, the classes that we taught, um, it wasn't just Marie and I in there, um, Brianna was always there with us, the other school's health um, teacher, uh, and we also had um, another art assistant, um, Robert, whose video you saw earlier. Um, and that was uh, to cover all of those bases. Um, we cannot answer, won't answer certain sexual health questions. It's not our job. Again, we're not educated to do, trained to do that. Um, so we would always, you know, the default would always be, you know, you have this amazing resource. 
resource, you should get a room 422. They're trained, they'll give you all the information you need to want about that topic. Um, but yeah, boundaries, boundaries were big. They wanted, they, it's amazing that they want to tell you everything, but you know, you don't need to hear everything. You just need to tell them where they can go to talk about those things. Um, so yeah, boundaries I think are a big, big one. But we would also like have, make sure that either Brianna or Nora, right, our other, who worked with us in the after school program, yay hey, Nora, <laughs> um, right, that they would also answer the questions that came up, right? So they would ask like a sort of, some kind of sexual health question, but we would encourage that question to be answered, but also answered by the sex educators, right? Again, like sort of promoting the health center and the resources that are kind of like available at the school, and then we're sort of there for the making of these other sort of gray area conversations, but that like Brianna and Nora and the after school program in particular were kind of there for the more like meaty technical stuff. Okay. I have a question. So, I mean, Brianna and Nora, so did different questions come up, because I mean, you're both talking to students about sex all the time, when you, when Liz and Irene were doing the curriculum, <coughs> did different kinds of questions come up? Or did, different, were you, did anything come up that you hadn't heard before in the students? Well, I, I'd say no, because the students, um, don't really have too much of a filter to like think like, oh, this is the appropriate time to talk about this question. Um, but it's not just students that have a problem. Yeah, but I would say um, that more questions about like why are we spending so much time about consent? Because um, in our like broader discussion, we would talk about consent maybe for one day, which is more than, you know, the Department of Education would have you do. Um, or, you know, talk about STIs for another day, uh, pregnancy prevention methods. But a lot of questions about, like, um, a, a lot of our students, because we also work in the international school, <coughs> who come from very different backgrounds. Uh, so some of them who are more religious would ask, like, but, miss, like, I'm not having sex now. Why do we have to keep talking about this? Um, and of course, my response would be, well, okay, you're not having sex now, but in the future, you may decide, you may not decide to have sex. But if you're ever in a situation where someone wants to have sex with you, or um, you want to have sex with someone else, how are you going to start that conversation? And that's where consent comes in. Um, so a lot of it was bridging the gaps between, well, why do you all think this is so important as to like, saying for them to be able to see in their own lives, how could I actually apply this? And I think, yeah. if I may add, I think part of what was also cool about that is we have the context of coming from Boston, right? So we're talking about consent, not only in the area of sexuality and relationships, but also in terms of what other parts of your life is it important to give your permission to know what you're consenting to, right? We can easily frame that with like, you sign a consent form for the health center saying, I know what services you have, and yes, I'm interested. But even if you're not having sex, and that's not something you ever see yourself doing, there are all different elements in our relationships that involve that principle. Uh, and I think one thing that was different about the after school group, and granted, I teach at a different high school, um, so I can't speak to your classes in particular, but the sharing that came up when we spent that much time talking about consent felt different, and there were a lot of very personal things shared, and these kinds of <coughs> investigations into consent that that haven't happened as much for me within the classroom. Um, I think just in part because it was so intimate, and you were hands-on, it was much more personalized in a way that is hard to um, kind of tap into in the classroom. Yeah, that was the amazing thing about having the um, the after-school program be part of our time at Washington Irving. So. This wearing consent project spanned two classrooms um, with two different groups of 20 students at the International High School, um, an after school program um, that we met with about eight times, but it was a two and a half hour program. Um, and the big difference, and, and then a salon that we had at the end, but that was for the entire school. Um, but the, the difference between the classroom and the after school is really interesting. And you know, we had the consistency with the students in the classroom, which was great, they showed up. Um, there was a lot of them, um, but you had 42 minutes to get everything done and have these really intensive conversations. And oh, to add to that, we were in the international high school, so that meant we had 20 different students at a time in seven different languages, and they were all at different levels. So 
um, the after school really provided this amazing opportunity to have more intensive conversations, like Nora was alluding to. Difference being that we did not have the consistency, and we would have, you know, two students one time, ten another, but they would be different. And then, you know, two weeks later, you would get those same two students with five others, and you know, so there was. I think I think what also comes up all the time in everything that we do at the health center is just trust and building relationships with these students. And I think for those in the audience, you can clearly see the types of people that we hire as health educators. Just having two people who are so willing to engage in these types of conversations and who are taking these questions so seriously and answering them to the best of their ability and um, just treating the students as equals in, uh, in that way is huge for what it does for their concept of the rest of the health center. Uh, what will happen to them when they come in the doors? Are the nurse practitioners and the doctors going to treat them as well? Um, who are, is it going to be scary? Who else are they going to find? So, what we found is that without them, you know, doing much more to actually drive students into the health center, they raise our, you know, status in the school and they raise the students' ability to trust us exponentially. Um, you know, knowing that they can come down after a class where they've heard about, you know, pregnancy or consent or um, healthy relationships and they have questions about those specific things, you know, that's one of the best ways that we get students into the health center, especially for the first time. Um, you know, they're always very reluctant to come into the health center. Often, particularly when it comes to students at the international school, they've had a widely varying range of health education in the past, experiences with healthcare providers, and really have no idea what to expect from us. Um, so having those <coughs> sort of places at the, um, at the front of the health center is, is huge for us. Um, when you walked into the project, what did you, what were your expectations? What did you think this was going to happen? And how, how was that expectation met? Or how was it, how was how were you really surprised? I guess, I think what I was probably most surprised about was, um, the way that Liz and Irene already have such an understanding of the ways that they would need to approach um, sex education and in the context of the schools that we're in. Um, you know, I think we usually think of what we're doing in the schools as just kind of flowing around barriers of red tape and things that we can and can't do in that setting, and they were game to cut through it from the very beginning. Um, so we tried a lot of things that didn't quite work or tried to do them in certain ways that didn't quite work and just sort of refined it down to something that was incredibly effective and I just their ability to not get um, dejected by that and to not give up around that was was amazing and I mean we've been doing informal things for a couple of years now but this project was um, it seemed to really kind of come in a complete package and it was all in spite of all of that that can really throw something off the rails that is a little bit different or doesn't necessarily fit into exactly what you'd expect to see in a typical high school setting. Um, so that was awesome. <laughs> um, and I just always, I mean, Brianna's been with us for less than a year, and her ability to drive this um, <coughs> has been out of control. She's amazing. <laughs> um, and, you know, her ability to kind of connect with the students and um, really make this project work in, in all types of different ways has been um, great to see. I mean, Brianna was like our tireless advocate, right? Like, I mean, she was amazing just like, talking to people about us, about her project, like principles to other people that she had much more access to, right, than Liz and I. Um, you know, I mean, it really would not have happened without Brianna. I mean, she's really like the person who made it all like run because we had all this stuff of her. I mean, it's as Caitlin saying, like navigating through the insane bureaucracy of six New York City public high schools, all housed in one building and like fighting for resources, right? You are your like energizer bunny increase really like one. But actually I was surprised at how many angle how many different angles you all approach the idea of consent. Um, like the the wearables is one thing and like having this ink that is UV activated and creates this like beautiful thing off of the transparency like blew my mind. Um, but also having it being Oh, I was gonna say, oh, yeah, they're, oh my gosh, they're so beautiful. If, <laughs> oh my gosh, and if, yeah, the things that the students created, 
like all. I just want to just describe because I actually haven't seen this yet. So. So these are the projects that we made in the two classes that we taught at the International High School. Um, so the wearing consent was literal. Um, the students all designed t-shirts um, through collage. Um, their um, ideas that they could use their own language to do so of what consent is. Um, thinking about um, how they would want to communicate that to whomever would see them wearing this t-shirt. So we talked through this idea of a physical campaign on the street and um, using your own words and the words that your peers and then your family and the people that you would want to communicate this issue uh, to would, would, you know, how that would be accessible to them. And we use this um, uh, product called Ingo Dye, uh, which is um, solar activated. So it's this kind of cool process that, you know, kind of cut through a lot of the, um, the, the issues and the heartache of um, screen printing. Um, uh, still to print 40 plus t-shirts with a lot, but um, it, it had this kind of cool effect. Um, it was almost like newspaper um, print, um, the final products. And so this is one of the designs by a student called Val uh, named Valeria. And it was this really kind of cool collage of all these uh, different uh, people of all different uh, orientations and identities getting together. Um, and it's all okay as long as there's consent. It's cut off at the top, but it actually says you want it to happen, and then consent on the bottom. And then, you know, she was very, she did a really great interview, and she talks very articulately about how she picked different couples, same sex couples, not same sex couples, and, you know, that, that was multiple. There could be two people, there could be three people, but if you're the first, it's all good as long as you have consent. Yeah, and then on the right, that's Valeria, like, wearing the t shirt on the runway at the six. Uh, and during the after school program, we also made t-shirts, um, probably one of the most provocative. Uh, that is um, Miley Cyrus on stage. Miley was very popular. Um, I love Miley Cyrus. Yes. <laughs> Still not asking for it. We made buttons. We made some wearable patches that with sensors that would light up when you touch them. Um, and uh, just uh, co-designed um, some of their messages about consent. Uh, that became then the temporary tattoos and uh, nail designs for the consent manicures during the salon at the end. The text for the tattoos was great. I mean, again, that all like was from the students. There are these like emoji tattoos. Consent is peachy with a little, you know, like all that all came from the students. Pressure isn't consent. Like just a bunch of great stuff that was like again important to us that it's sort of in their language, right? Whether it's English or not, that it's somehow in your language and a message that you can get out to other people. <coughs> I'm curious about like the high school students, they're sort of aware of the whole um, you know carry the mattress around you know project of the university and you know and you know around consent and because it's so charged in college right now. And so I'm just wondering like Know, in terms of like these, you know, groups of students and the high school conversation, like where do you think it may lead to in the later years and the college years when things get very, very, you know, messy? We did not talk about that project specifically with this group. Um, there were lots of reasons why we couldn't talk about certain projects. Um, one of them was the, the biggest one was a language barrier. Um, so. Um, there were just certain, we didn't, we didn't talk about Kara Walker either, which is an artist that we would normally, just because we couldn't dive in deep enough um, and explain in the way that we would have wanted to, so it wasn't responsible to bring that up. Uh, we did talk about rape culture though, big time, um, and uh, that consent is a big part of that and, and education around consent um, hopefully is a step toward um, you know, this culture, um, recognizing rape culture, um, eliminating rape culture. Um, you know, we, we talk to them a lot about, um, you know, it isn't just yes means yes, it isn't just no means no, which is why, you know, we use this larger, longer definition of consent that it is, that it has characteristics that are informed, voluntary, enthusiastic, or versatile because it covers all the things that you're talking about, that messy stuff that we're talking about. Um, we had another university group that did a whole project about consent called the gray area. Um, 
it's actually not gray when you start to break it apart. Um, and you know, that's what the education around this word does. You start to break it apart and it's kind of really simple what consent is and when it's not present. Um, and it isn't in a lot of college situations. You're drunk, there's no consent. You're on drugs, there's no consent. You're asleep, there's no consent. It's pretty black and white. Um, and those are the things that we were talking about with the students. Yeah, in, very, in, pretty, well, in, in pretty specific ways, but then also giving them the opportunity to talk about things that had happened in their own lives as well, right? Some of which we heard from time to time. But before we open it up to questions, um, I'd love to hear from, uh, from everyone on the panel um, kind of what, um, what, what's been the most meaningful moment to you so far in the, the process of, of working through this sort of this long-term engaged <coughs> art project? I mean, relationships have been built over long periods of time, and you know, some students are, are sort of you know drop in, you know drop in, drop out students, but some some students are are more engaged, and certainly it's been a process for all of you to engage with one another which, you know, is kind of another layer um, that, you know, you guys are, you know, clearly, you know, have a very good working relationship, right? But, um, but what, of, of all of that, um, what's, what's the moment that, that, has, that really told you, like, this is what I, I need to be doing, this is what I'm doing it for? Well, I would say, um, and there are so, so many moments, um, with so many different students. Um, but one of my favorites happened uh, during class um, because, as we keep saying, we worked at the International High School, um, which is like, it's, it's so challenging because, you know, there are seven different languages in one room. Um, and when you're speaking English and the person in front of you only understands um, Spanish, for example, um, and the person sitting next to them only understands French, it's hard to, to be able to say something and just, you know, hope and pray that they'll get it. But actually, the students took on a lot of that role in terms of translating for people who they might have been friends, they, they might have not been friends, but there are students who, like, without me even having to ask them, would say, like, oh, consent, it means that, 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 that. Um, and not just doing it once, like, oh, the definition, consistently doing it, doing it for the directions, doing it, um, translating back if they're, someone at their table said something, and they're like, oh, okay, without me having to ask them, what did they say, what does that mean, how does that, you know, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? The students were so proactive in helping each other and getting the message across that it's like, wow, if, if, if this is what they're doing in front of me right here in class, like what else are they going to be doing with this information at home, with their families, with their siblings? Um, which, which brings into to play that this is something that's not just a single conversation that we're having us with them, but it's that they're having amongst themselves. She was like, now I can say no. Like, I know that I can say, like, you know what I mean? It was kind of amazing. And then she's also talking about talking about this with her friends, right? And so you're like, okay, like, we did our job. Like, we really did it, like, in this really like, fundamental way, right? That she's articulating it unprompted, right? That, like, this is, this is what happened, and now I can sort of make this choice or these decisions. So I think, to, like, to me, that was it, right? Like, I was like, I felt like it was, was so... <coughs> 
challenging so often, but that to sort of have this little like nugget at the end, like we did what it wanted to do, and we would have these conversations with Caitlin before the whole project even started about the importance of like the students being able to like talk to their friends, right? This is not, this is something that has to, they have to be able to like live and embody, not just something that we're sort of talking at them about. And so to me, like that was sort of it. Like, you know, and this was in the classroom too, which was really hard to gauge what they understand in the classroom. We would leave and I would be like, I have no idea if any of this worked. None, right? <laughs> right? Like you're just doing your best, but like granted they're at crazy different levels. So some people are totally fluent and then some in English, whereas like some other students really understand almost nothing of what you say and they're all in the same class together. So it's just so hard to gauge sometimes. So to me, I just, yeah. Anyway, as soon as it's edited, we'll put it on. <laughs> yeah. No, I had a similar moment. I mean, Noreen, you know, texted me when she was listening to the audio files. She was like, I'm going to cry. So I went online. And, um, and yeah, the one, um, the student, Jin, who we worked with, I, I sat with him a lot in class, and he really, he never spoke. He never said a word. And, um, but he had this, like, kick-ass design, and um, so it was always, like, really encouraging of his work. And, um, it was so amazing to hear him talk about his shirt, like at length, and like super eloquently. Like, I had no idea. And for recording, I was like, <gasps> you know, it was just this amazing moment um, to hear, you know, to hear his voice. Period. Um, but you know, but also to be talking about this topic that we had spent time with, and you know, for various reasons, I'm sure he didn't, you know, couldn't didn't say what he had to say in class. So. And I think that's what we've concentrated on from the beginning is just, and we've talked a lot about in, in kind of our own internal meetings planning this, is just the value of starting these conversations with no intention of, you know, doing any kind of follow-up research to find out where they went and how many kids did you hit and how many kids went to the classroom, how many times, but um, just, to, just to put the value on, it's important to start these conversations, to see where they go, to let them go wherever the kids want them to go, um, and to just see all these light bulbs kind of turning on over the course of the project. Um, I think sort of to go back to the, to the question about um, how aware they are of kind of rape culture, you know, that's sort of, I mean, I think it feels so normal to them that to have a conversation like this where they realize that maybe that's not normal is, it's jarring to see happen and it happens so often. Um, and I think in the ways that this has sort of, I mean, at, at the high school, the most, um, the best way for us to get positive information around the school is still just gossip. So the ways that these conversations start and <laughs> spread is a huge tool for us in actually kind of making an impact. Uh, so we may not know exactly what this then spreads out to other students, but particularly in the case of quiet kids that you know are going to then go on to say something to someone else and or to just put words to it themselves for the first time and to be able to articulate that when they're in a situation where they're you know discussing consent is the goal. So I mean, my role was much further back, so I'm going to mostly talk to help Noreen and Liz through stuff. Um, so for me, I mean, I think that the, the thing that was most exciting was that they just did it. So, you know, I mean, let's, <laughs> no, really, I mean, like, sex education is not very glamorous. It's really it's hard to get into it, to go into a room and talk to a bunch of people about sex. And if they're different in any way, it's even harder. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so I was just happy that you did it. Um, because, in fact, the thing is I've been involved, and I, I often volunteer to, help consult with projects and then they just don't do it because it's too scary or because they can't get in, they can't get through the red tape. Um, but I'll say, I mean, but then maybe I also had a moment of like, my best moment was just as you guys were all talking because this other piece is like, one of the real problems I have with so much sex education is that it is about the goal. So it's, but we're gonna, we're gonna prove that 22% of students are gonna use condoms three, six months longer than they would have, blah, 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 blah. And it's all these nonprofits that are really just about keeping themselves funded, and doing curriculum that is not helping students. So the fact that you got to do a thing where actually you weren't saying this is the goal. The goal is to have the conversation and to just like let it go out there, I think is one of the things that's sort of radical about it, unfortunately, because I mean, that's what it should always be about. But. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, the power of art as opposed <laughs> to yeah. you know, traditional education or social work or other things. Yeah, yeah there's actually another thing um, that I didn't realize how amazing it was until stepping back and remembering that it's not always like that. But that we had these conversations with like males, females, everybody. Um, 
and the guys were some of like the most vocal, like adamant, let's go get consent. This is gonna, this is gonna happen. We're gonna make it work. <laughs> um, and, and just like even thinking back into um, because I, I did go to Columbia and I saw you know them out with the mattresses and everything. But even when they were telling us in college, it was like, okay, well, what things can you do to prevent yourself from getting raped? Um, you know, which yeah, fail on their part. But um, the way we were doing it, it was so proactive and very um, inclusive of like what everyone can do to have conversations with no matter, you know, the gender of the person you're having it with, um, and not talking about like, you know, what do you do to stop X from happening, but what can you do to make sure that, you know, that your partner understands what you want, that your partner knows um, that you know what you want. So yeah, that, that gender inclusiveness was, I didn't realize it was odd at all, but it was so amazing. It was. Yeah, just to give a little bit more context with the international school, besides the language barrier, the difference in, um, you know, cultural beliefs, um, <laughs> um, and, and so not only a wide variety of cultural health beliefs, um, a wide variety of experiences. So we have students in that school who uh, have never heard of puberty and have not even started that discussion to students who have had experiences with prostitutes who are married and parenting. It is, it runs the full gamut. Wow. So, um, I'd like to, to open this up to um, to questions, um, and I just you know I, I do want to say you know I think it's it's really great for artists to engage with communities. It's not easy. It's not glamorous work, uh, but this is exactly the kind of thing that can happen when art is the mode of engagement as opposed to some more traditional things, which are clearly needed, right? Noreen and Liz hold together with people who are experts, right? But, but that combination is where you, where you get the, the sparks, right? Um, and that's, that's what, what a belated grass hopes to see when, when we support work like this. So thank you, guys. You mentioned uh, seven languages. And, and you mentioned Spanish and French. Could you just tell us what the other languages are? Arabic, Bengali, Russian, <laughs> Russian Chinese, Mandarin, Cantonese. Yeah. There was more than seven. Yeah. And one of the things that we did, I mean, we were like panicked initially because we were just like, wow, this is just really incredibly difficult. But then we had this really great idea that we would actually have the students record their definitions of consent in their native languages. So we have recordings of like in all of these languages of the students defining consent. And then part of what we did at the salon with Aaron over here, right, was to do a whole like, yeah, to do like a whole remix of those consent definitions. But part of what they loved too was that like, you know, they would design these t-shirts and they would write something in French. I would then like take it home and we would try to like type it out in a font to put back on the t-shirt and then they would be like correcting me. So I would have these like worksheets of corrections, right, from the students, which like they were totally into, right? She was like, that is not right. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, like let's talk about that. So uh, my first question was actually, it brought me, I mean like the whole idea of sex education as a kid, I just just brought all these ideas and memories for me. So my first question was actually more of like the playful idea of like, well, did they approach you all, the kids, the teens, uh, did they approach you on like on a level of like, so have you ever done that? Or you know what I'm saying, like those more, sort of like the silly, like, oh wow, sex is like exploration, right? But then I, I felt like I, was, I would be a little mature if I asked that question. So, so, so my actual question is, <laughs> it actually relates back to the seven languages and the diversity of the student body that, um, that recorded the consent uh, definitions. Where did, how did you get to that place where you actually had a class full of international students? Was that even part of your idea process? Did it just fall into your lap because it would just happen to be the days that you were able to do it? Things of that nature. And then how did you sort of address the challenges? That's a very good question. Um, and 
you know, we, well, Brianna did all this bidding for us at the beginning of the school year. Who else come these two people who want to do a sex education project with your class? Um, and, you know, we ended up with one school out of six that was going to work with us. And, you know, I think really that high school will take, you know, they're, they're looking for resources. Yeah. They are, you know, anything that will make a school day easier for them. And I don't mean in a lazy way. I mean, no. you have a teacher who is, you know, working eight hours with 20 students speaking seven plus languages, trying to teach them every subject and it's you know it's it's so it's insane and um and so they were like yes yeah, we'll work with you and we're like great we have a school and um <laughs> which yeah then soon became this reality of like oh fuck how do we actually talk about sex education with these with these kids and actually have a more nuanced conversation about consent because right like brianna has been we were we were a four session add-on to the eight sessions that they normally get, which we didn't say earlier. So we were sort of exploding out the sex education that they normally get, um, and, and in particular, this topic of consent. Um, and so we wanted to, the idea of these four sessions was that we were gonna have this really nuanced conversation about consent, we were gonna take you to new places, we were gonna make these awesome t-shirts, and, and in some ways we did that, but we slashed and burned our entire curriculum. Um, and we brought, we hired our another assistant to work with us. So we had five of us in the classroom. We were not originally not going to do that. Um, Ms. Cheryl, who we originally thought she was the health teacher in the room, she could really like sit back and really help with like classroom management. She was in there with us. And you know, we created this plan that you know included all five of us and a lot of group work all the time. Um, and we also did things like, Marie was saying, you know, having the students be able to talk and use their own language to talk about this topic. Because, or start there, at least, um, because uh, it's a hard one, and we wanted to engage them in a way that made sense for them. And I think we would still, in some ways, we were talking about whether or not to sort of run the other curriculum that we wrote with another school that was native English speakers so that you could maybe have some slightly different conversations. But we got a whole other batch of other just really awesome stuff from those international students that we didn't plan on, right? Which is part of the sort of beauty of this kind of like projects and art making. Like we never would have done those consent definitions. Like we never would have, like we wouldn't have you here now because it wouldn't even like we wouldn't have been. <laughs> you know, but it's like we wouldn't have necessarily thought to do that. We wouldn't have needed. We wouldn't have needed to, right? And there's just something amazing about you know. This is just you guys have just seen a few of the t-shirts. But if you go online, I mean, there are t-shirts like with messages in all of those languages, right? Which is just really amazing. That again, just wouldn't have happened before. And seeing things that were culturally relevant, um, you know, consent means something different in all of those different languages too, um, and being respectful of that. Um, you know, we. we didn't end up with one definition of consent. We ended up with, you know, I don't even know how many t-shirts there are, but which is appropriate. Hi. <laughs> um, I was just wondering two things. One is if Corey knows sex with Sue, because I'm also from Canada. <laughs> and um, she's this marvelous woman who did this show every Sunday. And if you're Canadian, it was a huge staple growing up in learning and talking about sex. And she was seriously my hero, so I'm glad to her. Um, I was wondering, in the international schools, we I work with them like in arts education too. That, I'm not sure if it's the same one, but um, sometimes I find it can be not irrelevant, but it's like what they're dealing with, because a lot of them are such newcomers to this country, is so much, is so far beyond like arts education or sex education. They simply are finding out like what a grocery store kind of is. Did you guys experience that when you were talking about sex, where you kind of thought maybe we should not simplify it, but get to like even more basics. Yes, that is that is totally true that there are so many more relevant things to that group. However, I mean, sex education isn't just about having sex. It is like, it is your, it is your identity. It is knowing your body. It's, you know, knowing your emotions, which is why I don't know why we don't fucking do this in this country. Like, why are those things not prioritized? Like, why? Not you, why? You know why, you're from Canada. But like, <laughs> like, that's like, why? You know, do we not?
not prioritize this. Yeah. Um, so we took it from that in a very practical place, and it wasn't all about sex either. You know, we talked about like permission. The school has this like crazy metal detector that all these kids have to go through, like they're going through an airport or stairs. really more like prison. Yes, yeah. to get Bar. into school in the morning. Yes, so bars, alarms. You know, so it was a. It was also talking to them about that, you know, the consent that they do and do not have, um, and the permission that they don't have, do or do not have control over entering the school building every day. So we did bring it back to relevant points then, but it's yeah, I mean, it's it's true. But, but also the fact that they are you know international uh, students actually makes for a lot of really in-depth conversations. For example, we had a class talking about. Um, gender identity and sexuality, which I was like, oh my god, how are we going to make this work? Especially considering during the consent class, um, I forget which of the, the AIDS gate, I think that was the picture y'all showed, um, and about, yeah, about homosexuality, and one of the students was like, oh, well, there might have to be burned gays. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, thank you for sharing that with me. Because, I mean, I realized that he wasn't, like, saying, um, a value judgment on what does it mean to be home. Yeah, he was just literally saying what happens in my country. Um, but the conversations we had about it, for them to each understand their own gender and what it makes them feel like, what it makes them think about, was actually a lot easier in their class than in a lot of other classes um, where people, I guess, take everything they do for granted all the time as being accepted as like the only way. Um, so actually being in a lot of, in a diverse classroom gave a lot of very good discussion. Yeah. yeah, and we were, I mean, we were just really lucky because we knew that Brianna was in there before us. Miss Cheryl was really lovely, the woman whose class we took over. So we were relieved of like doing some of that work. And too, if stuff came up, I mean, part of the beauty of this whole thing was again that we could also like we knew where to refer students to for like serious long-term help, right? Because there's social workers in the health center, right? There's other people that they have free access to the <coughs> time they want. So like any time anything ever sort of gets super difficult, you can always again just like refer people to us. So we were really lucky, I think, in that way, right? Like whereas you were there with them like all the time for the entire semester, and when more of that stuff is going to come out, right? Like, but to get into the classes, do you have to, um, do they sign consent forms or do their parents have to sign consent forms? We leave that up to the schools in terms of consent for us to be in there. Technically, not being part of the DOE, we don't need to get consent, but we always let the principals know beforehand what we're doing in case they want to send home an opt-out letter. I don't think they typically choose to do that, um, so that means if someone does opt-out, they have to provide a whole other you know, plan for that student. Um, we don't generally have people opt out. I think the principals, we, we, it's difficult to get into the classrooms, but they do recognize the importance of what we do, and that has been hard won over years of building relationships with them. Um, but we do have consent for the students to use the health center, um, and most of this, I think about 80% of the school by the end of the year usually consents for those services, whether they use them or not. So typically in those classrooms, we have students whose parents um, know what we do. Whether they understand that fully or understand what we're doing always in the classroom is, is not um, clear. <laughs> well, basically, yeah, I just wanted to know <clears throat> if you've ever got any pushback from any of the parents, you know, about the stuff that you're doing and just how aware of it they are because, um, yeah, I just feel like that's always, I feel like that's kind of what a lot of schools have been afraid of maybe in the past, keeping it really, really safe just so that we, you know, um, yeah, don't wrestle anybody or everybody's okay with it um, on all levels, religious and otherwise. Yeah, have you heard from any parents or comments back from parents for this particular project? Not for this project. <laughs> and we had consent form. We sent home like consent forms to document people. So when you see people's faces in those photos, we have consent forms from their parents. But we also you know, we said that we're specifically talking about consent and healthy relationships. I didn't, we didn't, right? Like, so, which is what our project was, right? But, you know, it also doesn't say scary things like consent. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, um, we've definitely, with the health center generally, uh, we've had parents call in every once in a while that are upset or come in 
Um, it's almost never about what we're actually doing. It's some other issue that's going on with them and their family. So usually, you know, we'll um, explain that the student was fully within their legal rights to access whatever service that was, kind of explain a lot of the parents, and usually um, I often will thank them for being an involved parent. It's so great that we're actually hearing from you and, and being engaged with your student's life. And after that, they're almost always like, well, it's just that this is happening. I can't get her to stop doing this, and what am I supposed to do? And um, so often that will end up being a way for us to actually engage the parent more, get them in to be with the um, social worker with their child, or just to kind of feel heard and um, just to validate what they're going through uh, with their kid. And then it's, it's, it's easy for them to blame that, but it's never usually the issue. I don't think we've ever had a situation where it was just about the service we provided that kept on that line. Cool, thank you. Well, thanks everybody for coming. I invite you to um, have a snack, have a glass of wine as we wrap up for the evening. But I uh, really want to thank our panel for taking the time to be with us and for sharing this project with us. It's such an important one as, as all the projects we supported this year were, honestly. I knew that. But thanks so much.